morning. morning. Welcome all of you to worship with us as we gather in God's house as we begin our worship today. Please take a moment and greet one another as we gather today in Jesus' name.
Grant us, Lord, the spirit to think and do what is right, that we who cannot do anything that is good without you may by your help be enabled to live according to your will. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Now we turn our attention to our scripture lessons for today. Our first lesson from God's Word is from the Old Testament prophet Jeremiah, chapter 23, the first six verses. Woe to the sheep of my pasture, declares the Lord. Therefore, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says to the shepherds who tend my people. Because you have scattered my flock and driven them away, do not bestow care on them. Punishment on you for the evil you have done, declares the Lord. I myself will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries where I have driven them, and will bring them back to their pasture where they will be fruitful and increase in number. I will place shepherds over them who will tend them, and they will no longer be afraid or terrified, nor will any be missing, declares the Lord. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch. I will reign wisely and do what is just and right in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved, and Israel will live in safety. This is the name by which he will be called, the Lord, our righteous Savior. This is God. We'll join now in singing our psalm for today, Psalm 23, printed in your worship book.
So they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. But many who saw them leaving recognized them and ran on foot to the towns and got there ahead of them. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. This is the Gospel of the Lord. You may be seated. We'll join now in singing our sermon hymn. It's hymn 752. You'll find that in the blue worship shuffling in Christ alone. history, humans have built fences and walls to try and keep the peace. Right? When, when 
neighbors have a problem with one another, often the, the solution that's arrived to is, we'll just put up a fence and that'll make sure everything's okay. When one person wrongs another, it's pretty common to put up an invisible barrier or fence where each person ignores the other person just to keep the peace. It's not a recent phenomenon. We can point back to some bigger walls that have been created throughout time. We think about the, the Great Wall of China or the, the Berlin Wall put up to, to maintain and keep peace. Yet history tells us that those walls failed. Rather than making peace, it actually created more hostility as, as people were reminded of the, the division that exists. It had been a, a short-term peace that it achieved, but, but in the end, that was really just a false sense of security that there was peace when true peace didn't exist. True peace does exist, only it comes not from building walls, fences, or barriers. Actually, it comes the opposite way. True peace comes from tearing down walls and fences. Forgiveness and, and reconciliation are what bring true peace. And we see that no place better than with our Savior Jesus. On that wall that separated us from God because of our sin and because of that gave to us a true, lasting, and eternal peace. Marvel at that peace and worship our Savior for the peace that he brought to us. We want to heed his encouragement as we live in that peace to tear down those walls. That's the theme we want to keep in our minds today as we turn to the, our text for today. It's from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 13 to 22. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one, and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, to death their hostility and preached peace to you who were far away, and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access to the Father and Spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people, and also members of his house, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too, the dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. So far, the words of our text. Now, in our text, Paul uses the phrase, the dividing wall of hostility. For us to better understand and fully appreciate peace that we have in Jesus, it's important we understand the reference Paul is making when he uses that phrase. Paul is two different walls by talking about the dividing wall of hostility. The first wall he's talking about is the, the wall that existed between the Jews and their, neighboring, uh, their neighbors, the Gentiles. You see, while God's moral law, as we know it in the Ten Commandments, is for all people, put a, an invisible fence or barrier around his Old Testament people by giving them the civil and ceremonial laws. However, that wall created quite a bit of hostility between the two groups. In time, the Jewish people began looking down in a very condescending way on their Gentile neighbors that they were the people of God and the Gentiles were not. They thought themselves to be a, a higher class of people because of that. You can imagine the type of ill will, that kind of an attitude bred between these two groups. And we look throughout history that there was a constant 
hostility between them because of that. The second wall to which Paul is referring, however, is a much greater wall. You see, much bigger than the wall that existed between the Jews and the Gentiles, the wall of hostility that was between God and all people because of sin. See, that's what sin does. Sin, sin separates. Sin, sin causes a barrier between people and God. So many people today like to, to convince themselves sin really isn't a big deal. People from God and, and brings hostility that relationship. You see, the hostility we have toward God comes because of the perfection that, that He demands for us. How angry and we can get toward a God who demands way more than any one of us are able to give. We chafe under the fact that no matter how, try, how hard we try to, to earn that perfection that God demands of us, we can't do it. And when those imperfections are pointed out, when it, it's, it's made evident that we have done wrong instead of right, we grow in hostility toward God. Think about a, a child who, who grows hostile when parents try to discipline. Right? The child is mad the parent made the rule in the place. Then they're mad that the parent enforced the rule um, when, uh, and, and broke the rule himself and Pretty soon all of that builds up into a hostility toward the parents, which can last for quite a while. See, that's the hostility that both the Jews and Gentiles had as a group toward God because of their sin. And that's the hostility that was in our relationship with God because of our sin too. Our sin put us under God's condemnation of death. The words that Paul spoke in verse 12 of this chapter fit us exactly. He said, you were separate from Christ, excluded from the in Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope, without God in the world. And at that time, there was no peace. Yet the way Paul begins our text, tells us that the situation for us has been changed completely from that. Notice how he starts. He said, But now in Christ Jesus, you once who once were far away have been brought near. You see, what once was a relationship of hostility is now one of peace. That wall that divided us from God has been torn down. Now rather than being separated from him, we have access to God. And what is it that changed this situation? It was the blood of Christ. When Christ came, he, he nullified the law. Now, it's not that God from us now what he did then, but it's the fact that Christ kept that law perfectly. And a perfect Savior went for a substitute to die in our place. And it's because of that perfect life and that sacrificial death and his victorious resurrection that God brought to us reconciliation. God used all of that to, to reconcile us to himself. And it's that reconciliation that gives us peace. See, now covered in the perfection of Jesus, we meet the standards God demands of us. Now covered in the blood of Christ, God sees us as the holy, righteous people He demands we be. It was our Savior who tore down that wall, got rid of the hostility, and brought us true and lasting with our Father in heaven. And oh, what blessing that peace brings to our life. See, Paul goes on to apply this now as he, he goes on in, in verse 19. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people, and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. See, your status before God changed completely. And through Christ, you have been given an entirely new life. Yes, once you were far 
separated from God, but now you're a citizen in his kingdom, having all the rights that go along with citizenship. Once you were far off from God, now you're part of his family. That close, intimate circle. Once you are far away from God, now you're part of his building project, a living stone being built together with fellow believers to be the temple of God. And this comes to us because our status has changed. Now we have the peace. God doesn't abide when we sin against him. But rather through word and sacrament, he reminds us and assures us of the, the forgiveness that Jesus won for us. Now we have the peace of God's love and care and protection as we face the trials and troubles of life. Now we have the peace of knowing that when those challenges come into our life, God is allowing them because he is angry or hostile with us, but as another opportunity for him to demonstrate his love and care to us. Now we can live our lives in all things with the peace of knowing that we are in God's hands. As you ponder that peace and rejoice individually in the peace that God has given to you in Jesus, know that what is true for you is also true for the person sitting next to you and in front of you and behind you. You see, Jesus didn't just tear down that wall for you. He tore it down for all people. He didn't just give you, other and you peace with him. He did that for all people. That tearing down of the wall not only connected each one of us to our God in heaven, but it connected each one of us to each other as the people of God. I think sometimes that can be easy for us to forget. Someone, when, when someone wrongs us, or even when we perceive that someone has wronged us, even in the family of believers, we can instantly throw up that invisible barrier that says, you know what, I'm just going to ignore that person and ignore that person so that we can keep the peace. When someone has a, a sharp disagreement with us, up go the walls. When someone has an idea to, to follow another's idea, that builds walls. And that's human nature, to build walls in an attempt to keep peace. But that really doesn't bring peace. And that increases the hostility. Because it's a reminder of the difference that is there. Ignoring the elephant in the room doesn't make the elephant go away. And so putting up in fences doesn't bring peace, forgiveness, and reconciliation. Let's remember what it is that makes us one and what it is that unites us together in the first place. We are united together not because we prefer the same style of worship or have the same thoughts about the church budget. What unites us together is not that we agree on the color of the where the coffee pot should go in the kitchen. What unites us together is not our age or race or sex or how much money we have or don't have or whether we were born in the north or the south. What unites us together is the blood of Jesus, our Savior. We all share the same peace with God and same access to our Father in heaven. We all share the same love and grace that is offered by Jesus. We share the same forgiveness of sins and the same certainty of eternal life with God in heaven. We all share the same mission to glorify the lives that we live and to proclaim his word every day that we're on this earth. What makes us a Christian community is what God has done and what God continues to do for us. We are united together in this Christian fellowship because of the peace and forgiveness 
that we have in Jesus our Savior. And as we live in that peace and forgiveness individually with Jesus, it is that same forgiveness that we strive to, to display in our lives toward one another. You see, tearing down walls and removing hostility is possible only through forgiveness and reconciliation. Now, please understand, that is counter to our culture today. That's not the way that our society operates. In fact, our society is just the opposite. Our society likes to hold every single tiny wrong against people. We vilify one another for, for even one tiny little mistake. Social media only increases the gossip and slander and the hostility that exists. No, in our world today, people want to be able to hold every single little thing against another person. We want to make sure that they get punished when something goes wrong, that they have to, to pay for what they did, that we get compensation even when there's one tiny little thing that we perceive to be wrong. That really doesn't bring peace. All it does is increase the hostility. It's forgiveness and reconciliation that brings peace. Being able to, to let go of hurt feelings and to be able to offer forgiveness when someone wrongs us that peace See, and using today's language, we might say that it, what, what, we need to make sure that we have thick skin and not get offended at every little wrong that happens because guess what? In this world, wrong's going to happen. Mistakes will be made. People will hurt us, sometimes intentionally in their anger, as we also might do to others. And that's when we remember that every time that happens, when we sin against someone else, God forgives us. He offers us peace in Jesus. He lets go of those hurt. He, he removes that sin from his sight as far as the east is from the west. That's what brings peace. And that's the peace that we want to display in our relationships with one another. So Jesus says, tear down the walls. We are united as the people of Christ. When someone sins against you, offer them forgiveness and yours and let go of those feelings of hurt. If you're the guilty party then with a broken and contrite heart take that sin to your brother and sister and seek peace and reconciliation. Jesus removed the wall that divided us from God. He removed and gave us true peace. Now strive to emulate that peace in your lives to work together as the people of God to carry out God's work. Seek that peace and reconciliation. Let's focus our attention more on peace and reconciliation instead of let's demonstrate we can have differences of opinions on the way things should be or, or differences of style and how we go about things and yet still live together in the peace of Jesus. With confidence in your Savior for what He has done, and for what he continues to do. Seek that peace with one another. And tear down those walls. Amen. Please stand. Now may the peace of God which passes all understanding make you your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. You now join our hearts and voices as we sing that we praise you, O God, in your worship of
gather the offerings as we do that. I would ask that you please take a moment and sign the friendship pad on the inside of the pews. Once you've done it, pass it to those who are seated next to you that they also might sign it today. We worship the Lord with our gifts. Make them men of both courage and prayer. Reserve Christ-centered doctrine and practice in our fellowship at all times. Make each of us active in Christian service 
and supportive of our leaders. We thank you for the many children who attended our vacation Bible school this past week, with whom we were able to share your word. Bless as it was shared with these children, and through that message, bring them closer to you. Thank you for the many willing volunteers who gave of their energy to support and carry out this ministry. We ask that you would be with Joe Marsden, who this week will be leaving for Air Force basic training in San Antonio, Texas. Watch over him in his service to our country. Keep him safe through this training. Continue to remind him of your love and care and send your angels to watch over him. We also rejoice with Eric Ashley and his family that you granted a successful surgery to his mother as uh, she received last evening. We thank you for keeping her safe through that surgery and we pray that you would bring her quickly through this to recovery. Remind Eric and his family of your continued love that you have displayed for them in Jesus and keep them safe in your everlasting arms. Finally, we ask that you would grant safe travels to all the men throughout our country and around the world who will be attending our Synod Convention in Saginaw, Michigan. Guide these men in their discussions and decisions that we might continue to move forward together, united by your truth and aggressive in our efforts to further your kingdom and spread your word. We pray all of this in the name of Christ, our Savior, who also taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, Almighty and Everlasting God, you have brought us safely to this new day. Defend us with your mighty power, and grant that this day we neither fall into sin, nor run into any kind of danger. And in all we do, direct us to what is right in your sight, through Jesus Christ, our Lord.
glad to, that you were able to join us and pray that you'll be able to do so again in the near future. If you haven't done so yet, please introduce yourself on the way out so you can get to know you a little bit better. All the announcements for today are in the back of your worship folder. I um, would certainly like to thank all of our volunteers this week who gave up their time and energy to uh, to help our, with our VBS, another successful program, uh, and it doesn't happen without the, the willing help of all of our volunteers. So thank you to everybody who was, was part of that this week. Um, I would highlight that I'll be leaving tomorrow morning for the city convention, um, and I will be gone through Thursday evening. Uh, certainly if there's anything that you need, uh, you can leave a message on my cell phone, I'll get back to you. Um, you can probably contact my wife and she'll know how to contact me. As well, if you're interested in following any of that, you can go to wells.net um, and search for the convention. Um, I think pretty much everything will be live streamed, so the opening service and, and the different parts of the convention. If that interests you, uh, please check out the Wells website for that. I believe they normally have um, kind of video snippets every morning of what happened the day before too, so that might be another way to keep in, informed of it. Um, at this time, we're directly into to our Wells Connection, the July edition of our Synod's um, newsletter. Thailand is 
if just like a, a baby, you know. So they kind of need some some strength or support from the, the brothers and sisters in the U.S. In years past, other denominations have come to Thailand to establish Christian churches. But at the local level, those congregations have often not stood the test of time. In many cases, our pastors have reached out to these groups, bringing them into the Lutheran fold. I visit and I wish people in, in the Hindu country that I visit them you know, and talk to them about you know, doctrine or Lutheran teaching you know, and teach them. A key to a self-sufficient church is economic stability. One group actively working to address that situation is called Thai Village, an independent non-profit run by Wells members. Crafts are made by Thai people and then sold in the U.S. We work with people all over Northern Thailand in, in their villages and different towns and cities and here in Chiang as well. It lets them know that we are a community of, of people that is motivated by um, a desire to help and to serve others. Um, that, in turn, uh, opens doors for us to be able to present the gospel to them. Our efforts have been blessed in Thailand. As the gospel is preached, it's changing hearts. Mission Outreach currently reaches about a dozen locations in Northern Thailand, and those connections are expanding. For example, there are now Hmong contacts being explored in Laos, Vietnam, and Western China. For more, visit wells.net slash missions. All of our staff and we wish God's richest blessings as we have grown in God's word today. Let us go with God's word. Those walls. Have a great day and a great week in God's grace. Thank you.